Today on the show, we're putting the needs of the podcast before our own, Leo, just as we were taught in the siege. Indeed we are. And then when someone adapts us, they're going to just, we're going to be rebellious and we're going to just, totally. our own needs. <laughs> we're going to hate podcasting. Fuck podcasting. That's how you control people. <laughs> Welcome to Gamjabar, your guide to the iconic world of Dune. We'll be exploring the themes, philosophies, and characters found in the sandy depths of this vast universe, from Frank Herbert's groundbreaking novels to the adaptations on film and TV. My name is Leo. And my name's Abu. And today on the show, we are talking about Shani. Uh, so I'm so excited to talk about this because yeah. obviously this is become a bit of a hot button topic since the movie has come out. We're going to get into all of that, but I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. Let's take care of some housekeeping. Let's talk about the game plan for today's show, and then we'll get into it. So to kick it off, a spoiler warning up top. Today's episode will contain spoilers for the first new novel right. and for both of Denny Villeneuve's films, part one and part two. So make sure you've watched both movies and make sure you have read the entirety of the first book. Indeed. Now, as always, we want to start this episode with a huge shout out to our Quisats Hatterack level patrons, Case Aiken, Jonathan Lambert, Daniel Dion, C.R. Spruill, and Roman Caballo. Folks, we have no doubt that if we were to secretly slip you just a trace amount of the water of life, <laughs> uh -huh. my God, you'd be Saidina candidates. <laughs> no question about it. It's true. The number one quality for a Saidina, I'm told generosity yeah and these people these quizats hatterack <laughs> patrons they got it folks <laughs> they've got it in spades <laughs> well with housekeeping out of the way let's talk about how this episode's going to be structured because this is cool we're going to have a, a bit of a guest which is very yeah. exciting so today's episode we're going to start off by exploring what we know about chani's early childhood drawing mostly from the Dune Encyclopedia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then we will chat about our thoughts on the major changes made to her character in Denis Villeneuve's blockbuster films. And then finally, we're going to wrap up by sharing a little interview with a very special guest, a doctor. Yes. Perhaps the first doctor we've had on this podcast. Perhaps. Unless you're secretly a doctor not, and you haven't told no. me. Okay, okay. No. Okay. No, no, no. Not that much debt. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> well, before we get into all of that, let's take a quick break. Right when we're back, we're going to be talking about Chani's birth and her earliest years in Siege Tabur. So don't go anywhere, dear listener. We'll be right back after just a minute. Welcome back, everyone. Let's get into it. And let's start with Chani's life. At the beginning, which feels like a great place to start. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about her earliest years from birth onto childhood. So Chani Kynes was born in Siege Tabur, ever heard of it, in the year 10,177 AG to Liet Kynes and a Fremen herbalist named Ferula, about whom we know very little, as we will explain shortly. Yeah. But first, let's talk about her father, Liet Kynes, which we know quite a bit about. He's a major character that we meet in the first book. Liet was also born in Siege to Burr, and though he was raised among the Fremen, by the time he was an adult, he had taken over his father's role as the imperial planetologist of planet Arrakis, and also the secret leader of the Fremen, the carrier of their dream for a green Arrakis just as Pardo had planned. So secret, everyone says Liet all the time, <laughs> as everyone's always dropping in his name. <laughs> just whispering Liet constantly. Yeah, it's a terrible way to keep a secret, but <laughs> tell the women to it. <laughs> now, when it comes to Chani's mother, Farula, as we said, we basically know nothing about her. She was an herbalist, and she gets mentioned all of exactly one time in all six of Frank Herbert's Dune novels. So, big question mark about Ferula. All we know is a name and what she did, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Now, 
We don't learn a lot about Ferula, and we know quite a bit about Liet, but what's important to note is Chani's earliest years, the very earliest years, were basically spent entirely with Stilgar. Stilgar and his wife, Misra. Uh, and this is especially true, partially because Liet was always off busy, you know, doing planetologist stuff, but also because Chani's mother, Ferula, <laughs> ever heard of her? The answer is no, was actually crushed <laughs> by a rock slide. Oh my goodness. When Chani was three. So very, very sad. Yeah. Uh, mother dead at three. Very sad. Yeah. And, and you know, Fremen and Tragic Deaths, name a more iconic duo. <laughs> uh huh. This will become a bit of a theme in today's episode. Too. <laughs> True. Yeah. So that's the sort of scene, right? Chani is three years old. Mother is killed in a rock slide. Dad's busy off wherever. So her godparents, her official godparents, Stilgar and Misra, are basically the ones who raised her. And I think this is especially interesting now that we have faces to the names. We have Zendaya and we have Javier Bardem as Stilgar. Yeah. It's fun to think about these characters as kind of father-daughter surrogate, you know? Yes. I, I think it also paints a greater context for their relationship. Yeah. I don't know that from the book itself that I understood this, that Stilgar is Chani's godfather and for all intents and purposes played the father figure right. in her life. So that I think is really interesting to think about in the context of how the two interact in the book itself. There are moments where Sardaukar break out and Stilgar grabs and whisks Chani away first to protect yes. her and also, he admits to for, for the sake of Paul. But like that's a moment where you think, oh, his like fatherly mm, instinct is protecting Chani. Yeah. Even if she is like a fierce fighter and an incredibly capable young woman. Completely. So it's true. It's like it's not there on the surface, but the more I kind of dug for it, the more I started seeing little things. It's fun. It's cool. Totally, totally. Now, as a quick side note, and this is just a note more generally about Fremen. The Dune Encyclopedia makes it clear that amongst Fremen, the children are kind of partially everyone's responsibility, which is mm -hmm. very cool. Uh, so Siege Tabor, uh, I keep wanting to say it like it is in the movie. Tabre? Tabre? Tabra. Tabre. Is, tabre. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. An interesting choice on pronunciation. So Siege Tabor is like, is her extended family. So these are her people. And I think that is also very, very important to note when we see scenes like it being bombarded and the devastation and the loss, this is Chani's extended family. 100%. Uh, and from a young age, what do we know about Chani? Well, we know that Chani, as a, even as a very young child, was already remarkably independent and quick-witted. And although Liet was often very busy with like imperial business, he was also tremendously proud of his daughter. And on his rare visits to Siege Tabor, uh, Siege Tabor, I'm saying it weird now. <laughs> You're on overthinking his, it. <laughs> I'm overthinking it. On his rare visits to Siege Tabur, whenever he managed to make time, Liet would actually take Chani to his planting sites to, oh. quote, show her how the palmeries were expanding and would eventually change the harsh face of Arrakis, end quote. Nice. So this is really, yeah, dad, daughter dates, you know, going out, seeing the, seeing dad's work and, He's proud of her. He's proud of his work. It's cool. It's take fun. your kids to work day. Yeah. Take your kids to the Palmeries. <laughs> That's where I'll take my kids. And they're like, Dad, <laughs> this is not related to your work at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't you make podcasts? <laughs> don't, you, don't you do video game voice acting? I, why are we at trees? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's nice to see that, though. Right? Liet while he was busy and while he was not the most attentive of fathers in Chani's life, he was still extremely proud of her. I get the sense that he still very much loved her. And then to know that he even included her in his work yeah. and showed her the palmeries and would make time to go to Siege to Bert to see her and take her on these trips. It's nice to know that. Yeah. It's nice to sure. know that he wasn't just the most bum ass dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just off smoking Samuda with the other right. imperial, you know, employees. Totally, totally. Well, here's an interesting note about how Liet did choose to raise his daughter. Despite he himself 
walking in two worlds, right? He's right. got one foot in the world of the Fremen, and he's got another foot in the world of the Imperium. He decided to fully shield his daughter from any and all Imperial duties. Mm, yeah. He wanted to raise her as purely Fremen. And the Dune Encyclopedia makes it clear that he did this for two main reasons. Reason number one, he basically was doubtful that the Fremen would accept her were he to like die and were she to succeed him right. in this role as not only future Imperial planetologist, but also the role as the unofficial secret leader of the Fremen. Right. And this says quite a bit about Fremen culture, right? Like within Fremen culture, women had the opportunity to be in a powerful position as Saeedinas, as reverend mothers, as attendants of that role. Right, yeah. But women could not rise to the station of, say, a nabe. And so basically Liet was worried that were she to rise to this position of tribal leadership, of ultimate leadership of the Fremen, she would not be accepted in such role. Reason number two is that Liet honestly believed that by the time Chani's generation came of age and took on the responsibilities, they probably wouldn't even need a leader in that kind of position. Mm, yeah. They wouldn't need a leader who had one foot in the Fremen and one foot in the Imperium. And by the time that generation of Fremen took over, they were more than capable and motivated enough to carry on the slow burn of an ecological transformation of Arrakis. So that that speaks to his trust in that generation and speaks to his ambition with the plan as well. But those were the two main reasons that he chose to keep Chani's imperial duties completely out of it and only raise her in one of the worlds of which he was a part. And for that reason, Chani's earliest years, as we know them from the Dune Encyclopedia, were pretty standard stuff as far as a Fremen childhood goes. Yeah. So let's talk about <laughs> the typical Fremen upbringing, because this is mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a little wild. <laughs> so by five years old, she was doing the typical Fremen thing. You know, you're taking care of siege gardens. Uh, you know, yes, watering, yes, of course. You know. You're capturing sand trout. Cute. Something we haven't seen in the movie, but yeah, kind of the the larval form of sandworms. Yes. And uh oh oh yeah, and then one last thing. Okay. Uh, killing wounded enemies after battle. I'm saying it. Stabby stab. Yeah. You're like you get through a Harkonnen patrol, you got a couple of guys laying there like ah, you're like, all right, get the five year olds. <laughs> get let the kid bring the kids bring out. Bring the, the kids, kids out. out. They need the experience. <laughs> Their chubby little fingers. In, instead of recess, the kids are let out of school for an hour a day <laughs> to go clean up battlefields. They just have a, <laughs> the playground is just a collection of dying soldiers. <laughs> and all the kids are like, yeah, woo, yeah recess. Stab, and they all stab, 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 stab. 15 minutes later, all right, kids, come on in. Everybody in, oh, everybody in. Jimmy, Jimmy, God damn it, stop stabbing. Jimmy. <laughs> I only got to stab two. <laughs> 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 all of our all of our joking aside, my God, that's a morbid image. All of our joking aside, I wanted to highlight here what a stark difference this is between her and Paul. Yeah. My, oh my God. Goodness. So Paul was 15 before killing someone with a blade, right? Mm -hmm. By the time we meet Chani, she's been doing it for almost a decade. It's fascinating, but it also speaks to the fact that like the Fremen lifestyle is one that is governed by harsh necessity, right? It's mm -hmm. for the tribe. Your water is for the tribe. If you die, you hope your water can be reclaimed so it can help your tribe. Like life and death is a part of it. I had the same sense. My sister had a farm for a bit and like you get very like my sister's kids are like so used to animals like, oh yeah, we had a pet dog. It died. And I'm like, oh my God, traumatizing. They're like, no, it's fine. Like it happens. And I'm like, how are, what is happening? But I think what happens is when you live in a proximity to death and hardship, you acclimate. And I think that's going to be true for every Fremen on the planet is they're all Absolutely. constantly in proximity to death and hardship and strife and, and Amtal, which we've talked about yeah. before. Yeah, that's a great analogy. But 
Nevertheless, her responsibilities, besides stabbing wounded soldiers, uh, were also <laughs> of the mundane sort. She learned how mm-hmm. to make coffee. She learned how to weave, you know, make and mend still suits. I get the impression pretty much everybody in the siege is a handyman, like is oh, totally yeah. capable oh, of yeah. doing whatever they need to do, learning how to do that sort of thing. So in other words, until she reached puberty, Chani was basically learning everything she needed to be an adult in Fremen society. Yes, that's right. Now let's talk about what happens when she does reach puberty, because this is when a big shift in her life takes place. Reverend Mother Romalo, if you'll recall her from the first book, she leads Chani and a small group of girls around the same age on a short pilgrimage to one of the Fremen hidden water basins. And this pilgrimage, which is called the Hadra, had a secret purpose. It wasn't just to go see the water and res- pay their respects. Romalo was getting old. Yeah. And she knew that she needed to train a successor in time to take over her responsibilities as Reverend Mother of Siege to Burr. Now, in a little side note, she did have a successor, actually. <laughs> but yeah. this successor, quote, Died in an explosion in a siege factory. And Don't you hate when it happens? Uh, every every time I name a successor, <laughs> it's like it's the successor curse. It's... They end up in a factory. <laughs> yeah. Factory explodes. Yeah. I mean, I would say stop sending your successors to factories, but I know that's not going to stop <laughs> to you. To faulty factories yeah. of all. Yeah. It is a stark reminder, though, in all seriousness, of how fraught. Fremen life is. Yeah. To your point, like when you're surrounded by so much danger and so much death, it becomes commonplace in life. Here's another example of that. Romalo did have a successor, someone all lined up, trained up, ready to take over her duties. And then boom, one explosion later, she's got to find a new one. Yeah. And also another reminder, sieges have factories. This is something I feel like we don't really get in the movies at all. Totally. But it's something that is very present in the books. And I also want to say, like, when you think about someone like Chani, book Chani is going to be someone who's also familiar with, like, machinery and infrastructure and creating yep. these things, actually manufacturing products and goods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These aren't just Fremen savages, <laughs> as Baron Harkonnen would say. Like rats. These are these are a, an, an advanced people that have adapted their culture and their lifestyle and their industry and their technology totally. to surviving in the desert in ways that the rest of the Imperium is, frankly, behind on. Yeah, you totally. Know, no one else is making still suits of this quality. Yeah. So back to Romalo and this Hadra with the girls. Romalo basically alters a small quantity of the water of life, and she gives just a little bit to each of the girls and begins to assess and study their reactions closely. She's poking, she's prodding, she's asking them questions. This is a test Mm -hmm. for these girls. And as you may have guessed, dear listener, Chani stood out among all the candidates. Quote, she possessed courage, intelligence, and compassion. She was capable of considering her own mortality while discounting it in the light of her people's survival. End quote. That's so powerful. (laughs) Yeah, the very definition, I'd say, of a Fremen. So Chani officially is now the successor. She's been chosen as the Sayadina, as the Reverend Mother in training. Ramallah's going to prepare her over the years to take over that role. And this basically brings us up to the start of Dune. We get to the point where Chani has her fateful meeting with the Atreides and the course of her life is changed forever. Indeed it is. Now, we're not going to cover the rest of her story as beat by beat because naturally it's the book. So instead of doing that, we're going to share some interesting details that the Dune Encyclopedia adds to give us additional context to our understanding of those events. Yeah, some really interesting morsels here. Indeed. So the first one, in the year 10,191 A.G., Chani met Jessica and Paul, right, on that same fateful day that he killed Jameis. R.I.P. R.I.P. We're all a friend of (laughs) Jameis. And the Dune Encyclopedia points out a really interesting detail here. 
Quote, Both at that first meeting and on the journey back to the Siege, Chani found herself more impressed by Lady Jessica hmm. than by her son. End quote. Okay. So while, yes, Book Chani was swept up in the rumors of the Lisan al Gaib, what she's impressed by in the book, though, is how Jessica basically single handedly kicked Stilgar's ass. <laughs> right? <laughs> Chani sees Stilgar, the knave of her siege and her godfather, who is one of the most capable fighters in the siege, championed by a woman. Quote, no other female, to Chani's knowledge, had ever even contemplated equal combat against a Fremen knave. End quote. Oh. So, wow. So cool. Now, again, some of this may have to do with Fremen culture. Right. There is a sense throughout this that the women take pride in like being the storytellers and they keep the records and they keep the mythology and they keep the culture alive for the Fremen. That's a very important job. And they take pride mm -hmm. in that. And that's why it's an yeah. honor to be a Sayadina. And in the book, multiple times, she's present because she's a Sayadina and she can be a, the record keeper. Right. And to be, to be fair, like we said earlier, they also can't have the title of Nabe. Right. That's traditionally only given to the male fighters. So right, right, right. Uh, that, that's something as well, where she would have never witnessed this because no female has ever been a Nabe of a tribe right. in Fremen culture. Nevertheless... God damn, that must be so exciting. <laughs> like How cool. I mean, the effects that must have had on Chani to watch that happen. Yeah. Maybe there's a little bit of that later too where she's like knifing people. <laughs> Who's like coming to fight <laughs> Paul? She's like, "No. I can do this." Yeah. It also sets the stage for the relationship that she would have with Jessica where they weren't always friends. They weren't always close and they weren't always on the same team, but there was a sense of like respect. And Yeah. This is Chani recognizing that about Jessica. And then, of course, we have a lot of examples internally from Jessica of recognizing that Chani is very smart and very capable and very strong, yep. which is also very good. 100%. 100%. Very lovely to see these two women throughout the book and here in the student encyclopedia quote, clearly show respect for each other and awe for each other's abilities. The two most important women, perhaps in Paul's life. Yeah. Having that respect, even as you said, even when they're not on the same team, even when they're butting heads, there's that strong foundation of, I recognize your abilities. Right. And I think I don't think that ever goes away between these two women. Now, another small detail from the Dune Encyclopedia that we wanted to call out, I think really helps us paint a picture of how much Chani prioritizes the tribe's needs, just as she was raised to, mm. just as Ramalo recognized in that Hadra ceremony. So during the spice orgy, remember the spice orgy? Do I need to explic explicitly describe it? Everyone remembers from the book? Yeah. During the spice orgy, <laughs> as all the Fremen are joining both body and mind, Chani pulls Paul away, not only because he's sexy and he's got that amazing jawline and those stunning eyes and she wants to bang, <laughs> uh -huh. but also because she was thinking of her tribe. This is the quote from the Dune Encyclopedia. Quote, Sensitive to the wishes of others, Chani drew away Usul, allowing the tribe to enjoy their communion without the discordant note of a still alien mind. End quote. Mm, that's so cool. Really beautiful insight, I think. And, and a very clear example of a way in which Chani puts the tribe's needs first. Or takes action because of her Fremen upbringing and because of her love of her tribe and her people to do that, to take Paul away. Yeah. Not the most difficult of decisions, I'll admit, <laughs> like choosing to bang Timothy Chalamet, not a hard choice, <laughs> uh -huh. but certainly one where it wasn't entirely selfish. A big motivator clearly was her people. Right. And I think, so, so two notes. First, just that, again, something we don't really get in the movie as much and something that I think is easy to forget about the book is that the Fremen do have this sort of like unspoken wordless sharing of identity with one another during the spice orgies. Yeah. And then the second thing is th there are lots of examples of people accidentally doing things that seem compassionate and considerate on the surface. This is not that, right? She, of course, wanted to bang Timothy Chalamet, but also is like very actively like being considerate of the other people, which is huge. And that's worth its weight in gold for sure. 
Definitely. It's also worth noting that this is the night that Paul and Chani connect mm-hmm. over their lost fathers. Chani, of course, lost Liet Kynes. Paul, of course, lost his father in the attack on Arrakis by the Harkonnens. So this is something that they bond over here in this moment as they share both body and mind. And this is also a moment, I think truly a pivotal moment, for their relationship because Paul has the opportunity because of the spice essence that the tribe has now taken together. He has the opportunity to share some of his visions with Chani mm, yeah, to show her what he has seen. Not everything because his visions at this point are not clear. They're just flashes, right. but he's able to show her like, this is what I see. These are my abilities. This is what's going on sometimes in my head. And I think that is so powerful in building an empathetic connection. It's something where Chani understands Paul in a way that perhaps even Jessica maybe doesn't understand. And it's something that truly bonds the lovers together for life. Yeah, and she even sees visions of themselves. She was protecting her tribe against the discordant, still alien mind. She had no idea she was with the Kwisatz Haderach. (laughs) So she's like, he might have like weird... He might be whatever, freaking out. Outsider yeah, thoughts. Yeah, outsider thoughts. And then she's alone in the room with him, and she's like, I can fucking see the future. Oh, my <laughs> God. This is so much more than I expected. <laughs> Am I having an orgasm or seeing a jihad? <laughs> I get them confused often. <laughs> but it's true. Like, she sees, like, holding a child, and she sees him, and she's like, how can I see things? And how can I know you so well? And I think even in that sentence, in that scene... He's like, you are one of the most pe- like strongest people I've met or something like it's just like really beautiful, yeah. beautiful. It's moment. a really beautiful moment of connection. Yeah. And it actually launches into the two year time jump that we get in the book. Right. So during that two year time jump, Chani is watching Paul, uh, his power, his legend rise. And she even participates a little bit in his glow up in his come up. Yeah. Quote. She added to his stature among the tribes at times by fighting challengers she considered unworthy of facing him and sending them to the death stills herself. (laughs) End quote. What is Chani's body count? Yo, it's, I mean, (laughs) depends on how you're counting, but yes. She is absolutely the mini boss before the final boss that you get stuck on and you throw your controller. Totally. So good. Fantastic. It's also during these two years that she sees him ride his first worm, and they even have a kid together. They have uh, Leto the Elder. Yeah. And finally, the uh, last bit is she, of course, revives Paul from his coma using the water of life. And specifically in the book, it's something that she comes up with that Jessica hadn't even considered and hadn't even thought to do. Jessica summons for her and she and I, I reread this chapter today and it's so fucking yeah, I good. I it too. It's it so good. Jessica goes, I don't know why I called for your help. I it just seemed like I a voice from inside told me to. Right. Intuition. And then Chani's like, bring me water of life. And at one point, Jessica's like, what are you? And Chani's like, be still. <laughs> I was Yeah. She fully takes command of this moment oh. where Jessica truly thinks like. Paul is dying. Something's happening. She and doesn't know what. It's she, been weeks, yeah. right? His coma is like three weeks long in the book. And Jessica doesn't know. And her best guess is that the Harkonnens have a spy among the Fremen so, that poisoned Paul. Yeah. But she's done everything in her Benny Jesuit toolkit to figure out what the fuck is going on and has come up with Zilch. Yeah. <laughs> and then her intuition tells her, call in Chani. And Chani comes in. And just and boom, almost boom, immediately boom. Yeah. is able to solve the problem. She's like, it's pretty fucking ballsy for a guy to drink this poison, but it's something my love would do. <laughs> it's something Paul would do. Right. It's so good. Oh. Hubby would be dumb enough to try this. So, yeah, it's a really, really powerful moment. And I think another moment in the book where we see the mutual respect between these two women. Jessica looks at Chani in this chapter and is like, wow, she would have made an excellent Benny Gesserit. Yeah, yeah. It's a really cool scene in the book. 
Now, fast forwarding to the end of the book, as we all know, Chani is devastated by the death of her son, Leto the OG, and so devastated, in fact, that she gives water to the dead. Yeah. Something that she's never done before because she's a Fremen. Quote, the loss of her son had broken a reserve that had withstood the deaths of her mother, her father, and siege mates past counting. End quote. That's unreal. Yeah. To put in context how devastating the death of her son was. Now, despite this loss, she stands firm and she stands by Paul's side. And she spent the next three years after his victory over Shaddam at the end of the book, mm. negotiating the terms of surrender alongside Jessica. Paul basically asked his mother and he asked Chani to be the ones to go sit at what I assume is a very boring gray <laughs> conference room table in Kaitan yeah. and, and figure out the paperwork and the surrender and how he's going to get those uncreased Nikes. <laughs> yeah. And the Dune Encyclopedia tells us that during these negotiations, Jessica was astounded by Chani's diplomatic abilities and that, quote, we can safely assume that many of the concessions were won for the new emperor by his Fremen concubine, end quote. Mm -hmm. That's unreal. That's so unreal. wild to think about. Incredible stuff. And again, just speaks to many of the qualities that Romalo saw all the way back in the Hadra yeah. within Chani. Intelligence, compassion, dedication, the understanding of putting the tribe, or in this case, the emperor, the whole imperium, those needs above your own. She fought for Paul's empire and helped him obtain that much power and helped him depose Shaddam. It's really cool to know that. And, and sadly, not something we get in the book. This is from the Dune Encyclopedia. Yeah, we do get, and I and I wanted to to quote this because I think when we talk about her standing by Paul's side, right? She's traumatized by the loss of her son. She's shell shocked, but Paul insists, right, that she's alongside Jessica for for all of that. And what we do get in the book is specifically that Jessica will negotiate with Chani next to her because Chani quote has wisdom and sharp eyes, and it is wisely said that no one bargains tougher than a Fremen. She will be looking through the eyes of her love for me and with the thought of her sons to be what they will need. Listen to her. End quote. Hell yeah. And it's just uh, such a resounding like celebration of who Chani is. And keep in mind, this yes. is Kwisatz Haderach Paul speaking. It's so cool. I just want to point it that out. It is. Great quote. Yeah. I'm glad you pulled that. It speaks volumes of Chani's character and Paul's love for her and Paul's confidence in yeah. her. Yeah, yeah. One last note we wanted to call out here from the encyclopedia. I just thought this was kind of a funny aside. If Chani negotiating and gutting the emperor for everything he's fucking worth <laughs> wasn't proof enough that she's a total badass, she also spent these three years, like, constantly, I got the sense, like, every fucking weekend, dodging assassination attempts. <laughs> like, people were out here trying to assassinate the royal concubine all the time. Nuts. Yeah. And yeah, and obviously we're not spoiling anything past Dune, but she's in Messiah. So the fact that, which she starts is. 12 years later. So you just <laughs> imagine like <laughs> years of people trying to assassinate you and then just casually being in the next book and be like, what's up, y'all? She is so much more of a badass than we ever see on page yes. or anything. It's spectacular. So good. Right. Right. Uh, I... I need to see like a top 10 body count in Dune chart because mm. because Chani's up there. Chani's up there easily. And we're talking, are we five. talking like colloquial body count or like? No, no, we're talking kill like count, kill, kill, count. Kill, yeah. kill, 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 kill count. Okay. Is that the right phrase? Am I using the wrong phrase? <laughs> body count. Body count Nine is like a times sex out thing. of 10 is talking about sex. <laughs> is a sex And we, we okay. all know that's just Duncan Idaho. <laughs> that's Duncan. Yeah. yeah. Duncan is in all top 10 yeah. spots of that Margo, ranking. Margo and Duncan. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Kill count is what I what I've been me meaning to say this whole time. I was like, I, I would love to see Chani's. I mean, the Fremen count. body counts are also probably pretty high. The Sea Georgies. Do you count those? Oh, that's yeah. Easily, you count oh, those. Gosh. Okay. Yeah. Probably pretty high. Yeah. 
We got to crunch some numbers. <laughs> we got some numbers to crunch. <laughs> All right. Well, that covers Chani in the book. That goes through her early childhood. That goes through the events of Dune and paints us a really beautiful picture yeah. of this incredible character, this powerful woman, and this loyal companion to Paul Atreides who helps in his rise to power and is, in fact, critical at many junctures of it. Let's take a quick breather here, because up next, we want to talk about Denny Villeneuve's Chani. We want to talk about movie Chani in comparison to the book. And as you all know, there are some major changes. So we'll get into all of that in just a minute. We'll see you in a bit. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you crunched the numbers. Hope your kill count and body count are both <laughs> satisfactory. Yes. So, yeah, let's talk about book Chani versus movie Chani. And, of course, if you, dear listener, have seen the adaptation, Denis Villeneuve's part one and part two, you know that Chani's character was dramatically changed yes. for both better and worse. And it's easily one of the most divisive topics among fans. So we wanted to explore the changes and we wanted to share our opinions. We also sat aside some time to chat with Dr. Kara Kennedy, a.k.a. Dune Scholar, about Chani to get a fresh perspective. And yes. we wanted to for two reasons. Of course, Kara Kennedy it brings a female perspective. And I think when we're talking about how these women characters have been changed. There's only so much that Abu and I can talk about that. Certainly. But then also because Kara is a tremendously articulate writer. She's very, very good at laying out her reasons for thinking things. And we agree with some of what she says, and we don't agree with other stuff. So because her thoughts are different than ours, we thought it would add a new dimension to the conversation. Yeah. But before we get to that conversation... We want to cover the changes between the movie and the book in broad strokes, kind of boiling down some of what we've been sharing throughout today's episode into a kind of easier to digest list, right? That's right. So let's talk about these changes in super broad strokes. Of course, you've read the book and you've watched the movie, dear listeners, so you already have a sense of most of these. In the film, Chani is extremely skeptical of the prophecy. And she openly speaks out against it alongside her fellow, quote unquote, Gen Z Fremen friends <laughs> yeah. like Shashakli. And this, of course, is a huge departure from Book Chani, where she is a literal Saedina and her father showed her the palmry. She's a believer in the dream of a green Arrakis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. In the movie, Paul and Chani still do fall in love. That part of the character is completely intact. But... Because of the truncated timeline of the movie, it taking place over months versus years, they don't have a son. So we don't see Chani the mother. We don't see Chani being devastated by the death of Leto the OG. Right. Yeah. Also in the movie, in that pivotal water of life coma scene that we were talking about earlier, things are dramatically changed. Chani is basically forced to fulfill a prophecy that somehow involves her secret name, Sehaya, by Jessica's use of the voice. Yep. This causes a major rift between Chani and Jessica in the movie. We get that very intense scene between the two where Jessica is wishing her good luck and Chani basically spits it back in her face and is like, I don't need that from you, bud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course, by the end of the movie, it's clear that Chani disapproves of Paul's actions and that she refuses to participate in his rise to power. Or at least that is the implication of the final shot of the movie. So obviously some major departures from the Chani that we just talked about in the first half of this episode. The Chani from the book that we know and love. But it is worth considering why these changes were made and whether they were for better or worse. So we wanted to share each of our perspectives on it and uh, dig into this a little bit. Yeah. And I think broadly for both of us, I think we're generally in favor of these changes. And so while we have our nitpicks, especially, gosh, with the coma scene, um, having reread that chapter today, I think we can both agree that chapter fucking slaps. 100%. And 
would have been awesome to see it almost exactly yes. beat for beat. Uh, but in general, we do see a lot more of Chani in this movie than we do in the book. Right. We see her having a lot more agency, and at least we see a lot more choices that she's making and kind of really actively choosing her own path. And I think broadly we like that. But getting into kind of more like individual takes, what do you – how do you kind of – um, think of these changes. Did any stand out as as especially egregious? What do you think? Yeah, uh, of course we have our nitpicks, and I think we talked about them at length in our massive two part comprehensive analysis and review of the mm -hmm. film. So if you haven't listened to those <laughs> two episodes yet, definitely dive into those for our full thoughts on, in particular, the coma scene, which I had lots of issues with. But in general. I think a lot of these changes are for the better. I think they make for a more interesting character in Chani. I think they give Zendaya a larger role in the story and more to do. She brings her talents to the screen in a way where she would almost certainly fade into the background if we stuck one for one to Chani in the book. So I liked that. I liked bringing her more to the foreground and giving her uh, more active choices. Right, yeah. Now, to be clear... This isn't me saying that, oh, Book Chani is awful and uh, everything about her I want it changed. Not at sure. all. I love yeah. Book Chani. We just talked about it. She's such an incredible character. But I do have criticisms about how she's written by Frank Herbert because, in my opinion, she's not exactly the most fully fleshed out three-dimensional female character in the story. You can say someone like Jessica is, certainly. She's a major player, and we see her internal struggles, and we know she has motivations, both personally and for the people in her life, like Paul. But Chani, like, point me to a, a chapter in the book where Chani does anything that isn't directly related to Paul. Once she comes across Paul in the story, she is just a part of his journey. She meets him. And she doesn't make a single choice that I can think of in the story that doesn't affect Paul in some way. And she doesn't have her own character growth or emotional arc of any sort. And I want to be very clear, what we talked about today, all of that really great context about her childhood, her relationship with her father, the decision for her to be pure Fremen and not part of two worlds, her amazing potential that Romalo saw as a Sayadina candidate... And even later, once Paul rises to power, her clearly terrifying and very effective political negotiation abilities, all of that really cool stuff about her character is in the Dune Encyclopedia, almost entirely pulled from the Dune Encyclopedia. And while snippets of that are hinted at in the books, like that beautiful quote that you found from the end of the book, the reality of it hardly exists anywhere in the book. And... Frankly, without getting into spoilers for Dune Messiah in future novels, I can just say broadly that Chani does exist in those books, I guess, but she's barely on page. And when she is, 99% of the time, it is to serve as some motivation for Paul's actions or to listen to Paul's commands and do what he tells her to. And so for me, like I do have major criticisms in how Chani in the book is handled as a character. I would have loved to see more of her. I would have loved to have her play an active role in the major decisions in the story. And again, a lot of it is implication. She maybe does in the background or she maybe does off page, but that's a lot of us, the reader, filling in the lines. And you have, you have to sort of add layers of your own interpretation onto it. So I think the movie genuinely updates that in a way where... Movie Chani alleviates some of this issue. She is on screen much more. She has much more of an active role. She's given this emotional arc. She falls in love with this outsider. She has to reconcile the idea of letting this outsider into her life and into her heart while she also loves her people in the Fremen. She is given the opportunity to have character growth and character... What's the opposite of growth? Like, character not growth. Like, she has these ups and downs where... At first, she doesn't trust Paul, and then maybe she learns to trust him more, but then she's skeptical, and now she's turning away from him. And I genuinely believe that what Denny is doing is she, he is setting up 
some sort of reconciliation in, in future films where she comes to understand Paul in a way where we, the movie-going audience, can also understand and empathize with him. Prescience is a curse, as we book readers know. It's the worst fucking thing that could happen to you. And Paul now has to deal with it. But Chani has no idea of that, because all of that is still in Paul's head. So maybe we will get a future scene where he shares his visions with her. We didn't get it in the film here. But maybe in the future that will lead to some sort of understanding and character growth and evolution for Chani, where she goes from this rebel that we see in this movie to perhaps some sort of enlightened understanding that there is more here to the world and maybe some of Stilgar's fanaticism was grounded in some sort of necessity for the Fremen, right? There, there's an opportunity here for yeah, her yeah. to become a, a greater version of herself. Uh, an opportunity that I think she wasn't given in the book. She just, it just all took place, like presumably off page or in the encyclopedia or in, in other texts. And we had to draw the conclusions ourselves by reading in between the lines. Mm -hmm. So that that's where my criticism for the book, Chani Falls. I still love the character and especially given this amazing context from the encyclopedia I don't think anyone's out here arguing that she's not a total badass, but I do think the movie brought some of that more front and center in a way that's clearer to an audience who's just now finding Dune, to an audience that doesn't even know what a Dune encyclopedia <laughs> is, right. you know? Yeah, true. Uh, so those are some of my rambly thoughts. I'm sorry for going on so long, but I am curious. Leo, I think you land in a bit of a softer place than me. I kind of lean more toward... Love movie, Chani. Uh, I think you have a bit more of a tempered take on it. Yeah. I mean, so I think just broadly, I think a lot of these conversations get a little messy because people try to ascribe like intentionality to why the changes happened. And I think that's also where I find myself disagreeing sometimes with Kara Kennedy, where at times it's like literally saying the underlying message is this. And it's like, but if that's not the intended message, that is what you can rightfully take from it. But there yeah. is an intended thing. And I think most of the changes that Denny made, I see them as an opportunity to externalize some of Paul's conversations with himself. We need someone, a character, to be like, this isn't right. Because otherwise, there are going to be 70% of moviegoers going, what a great story about the hero Paul Atreides. <laughs> and I think that that is a very wise choice by Villeneuve. I don't know how I feel about it where it lands on like Chani as a character because as you and I have talked right. about, it's like we've traded some of the, the, the kind of beautiful love that she discovers with Paul for this sort of more cynical, angry character. Right. Now, I think another element of all of this is Chani, like more than in the 60s, the youths of today, I think I can say sounding very old, the youths of today uh, are fed up with institutions. And whether that's like religions or government, it's like there's a, a widespread cynicism. And I think that some someone like Chani in Villeneuve's adaptation is going to feel very accessible, even if it's not exactly what was in the book, right? So I think when it comes down to like Chani in the book as a flushed out character, I think that's where we more or less disagree only because I think Chani is like as flushed out as most of the other characters. Uh, I think Frank spent the time he needed to spend on the characters who are driving everything forward. And that is literally Paul Atreides and the Bene Gesserit. So it's like, right. we get a lot of Jessica. We get a lot of Paul. Um, it is still Paul's story at the end. It of the is 100% Paul's story. And especially after the coma, it's, Paul is the author, basically. He's he's right. orchestrating everything. So I think what Denny has done is rather – like I wouldn't frame it for myself as like she had no arc in the, in the books. I see it more that Denny has given us access to an arc that she could have had in the books that we just mm. didn't get access to because we weren't looking at the arc of Stilgar. We weren't looking at the arc of – Moheim, <laughs> we weren't looking at the arc of some of these characters that we meet. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I love that. 
That's a great. I way think at the it. end of the day, it's still a, a, a meaningful choice, right? It's a meaningful choice to make Chani basically a main character. She's she is very front and center, and that is a very large change, and I like that as well. I think the last thing I'll say here is just that I appreciate that we are having the conversation of like, how is it best done? Like how to do it best. And when it comes to being more inclusive and telling more of a story of a young Fremen woman or just a woman in general, giving access to a very authentic story and giving them fully developed characters with multifaceted personalities and wants and goals and aims. I think the only way we continue moving forward in expecting more from our storytellers is by having these conversations. So some Absolutely. young aspiring filmmaker goes, oh, I see what Denny did. I see where he could have done better and I'm going to do better in my yes. movies. So totally. I think totally. we both love the movie to death. We both love the book to death. And broadly, they both have issues. <laughs> um, yeah, But totally. I think that's that's kind of where I fall. And all that. And look, I say, I say this time and time again: loving a thing and never criticizing it is blind faith. <laughs> yeah, is the th literal thing Frank Herbert warned y'all against. Yeah. And to criticize a thing does not mean you hate it. Yeah. And to criticize something and critique it and want better from it is also an expression of love. It is okay to criticize things you love. Yeah. Now, those of course are just our two perspectives on this very hot button topic. But the rest of the Dune community out there is sharing all of their takes as well. And we've read many of them, including Dr. Kara Kennedy's article on Chani, her article on Jessica. It's out there if you're interested in reading. We'll have it in the show notes as well. But we basically got her on the line and we were like, hey, Dr. Kennedy, can we speak with you about your take on this for the Chani episode? So we want to share part of that interview with you, dear listener, that I think is relevant to this conversation about book Chani versus movie Chani, I think there's value in having another perspective that maybe doesn't necessarily match ours and is also from a perspective that we can't speak to, right? Because right. we're two, you know, hairy chested, manly men <laughs> yeah. who chop wood yeah, yeah. in our free uh -huh. time and uh, hunt boars. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think having Dr. Kennedy's voice was very valuable and we were grateful to talk to her. So we hope you enjoy this part of the interview. Indeed. Okay, well, well let's jump right in. We don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, Dr. Kara Kennedy, such a pleasure to have you on Gamjabar with us. Uh, we have read your works over the years and it's uh, about time we finally chatted with you. To start, to help our listeners and to help us get a sense of where you're at, can you just tell us in general how you feel about the changes that were made to Chani from book to film? Okay, that's a tough one. In general. <laughs> it's a big one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, the, the more I've been considering it, I think the changes to Chani are part of the larger changes to Paul's character. Mm. So I think mm. they kind of have to be seen um, in parallel. But my concern with the changes to Chani is that rather than having the many roles she has in the book, which people often forget about, that she seems to just be reduced to Fremen fighter mm. in the film. That seems to be her main role. And the, the love story seems to be quite mar marginalized. And the religious element seems to be completely flipped around. And she doesn't seem to be interested in religion at all, which I thought was, was quite a significant change to her character, but also the Fremen at large. And then, of course, the, the ending and having her storm off was... <laughs> Even people that really, really like the movie still seem to have a little bit of an issue with that ending. It was quite a dramatic change from the original story. Yeah, there definitely are a lot of changes. <laughs> and I think we also have had sort of an evolving take on what those changes mean for the individual character. But of course, the broader narrative and like Paul as a character, as you pointed out, it is quite intertwined. I want to hone in a little bit on the Chani as a skeptic as like a religious skeptic because that's like it's a huge departure from her character in the book where she's a Sayadina. she is literally like a reverend mother in training mm -hmm. and in this she's like all that culture shits but it's all meaningless it doesn't mean anything <laughs> how do you think this kind of affects the kind of audience's perspective on chani 
but then also just like how does this change affect the our perception of the fremen more generally yeah it's a huge change i to me it reflects a, a broader kind of hollywood maybe american western discomfort with religion uh, especially islam but also just religion in general and uh, trying to distance from showing people having a strong faith in something as being positive or good or even neutral um you can also see that with with what they did to stilgar's character so making chani into a skeptic for me i feel like it's difficult to to see what the fremen culture kind of holds on to we we don't get to see a whole lot of what the fremen culture is except for the you know so-called fundamentalist or the people that do believe in the legend that we seem right, to just right. see them and those are critiqued as kind of being brainwashed in the film and for me it was hard to see well what else is there to the fremen culture if we're, we're we as the audience are supposed to be taking chani's view of being skeptical and seeing the manipulation aspect what else is there that we get to see besides them fighting against the harkonnen and that that to me was having so much time in the film I, I was expecting for us to get to see the fremen culture get to see more what what are they doing when they're not fighting and it really seemed like they're either fighting or they're being misled with religious superstition and i, I didn't see a whole lot of layering or depth to their culture yeah. that i could hold on to besides those and that that for me what was was troubling about of making chani that character is what what else are, is there for the fremen culture besides just fighting and being superstitious. That's a great point. It's so interesting because I, I, I think about even cultures in the real world who have been invaded and colonized and brought religion was brought to them by the oppressors. But today, those religions are very meaningful to people and have a lot of value. And that's part of their culture today is this thing that was brought to them by someone else. And it's true that it is perhaps a shallow interpretation to say, the Fremen culture, if it was, maybe if the Fremen traditions were 100% introduced by the Bene Gesserit, then they're all bad and we should just get rid of all of them, feels shallow, it, which kind of is maybe how it, it comes across in the movie. That's a really interesting point. Yeah, and something I think that people forget about the Bene Gesserit or, or how, yeah, like you're saying, um, the Bene Gesserit have the missionary productiva, right? And so they implant these these myths and superstitions across across the universe. But they're not doing it to necessarily, well, at least described in the book, go in and control native populations all over. They're, it's They call it like securing a bolt hole. Right. Like if you happen to get stranded on a planet and you need to find safe harbor, we've kind of seeded the, the ground for you to be able to not get outright killed when you get there. <laughs> and that's exactly right. what, you know, Jessica is, you know, when her encounter with the shout out Mapes is, She's being tested. She's like, if I don't say the right words here, I'm going to get knifed, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so she uses the the missionary work to to essentially protect herself and protect Paul. Yeah. And yes, they do use it as a as a form of religious manipulation, but it was intended for safety, not mm. for we're going to go in and dominate all the people. And the Fremen had their own religion and culture before the the Bene Gesserit came in. It's just that component of it, and I think the film takes that component and makes it the whole thing. Mm. Right, right. Yeah. And to be fair, I think the film tries to hint at that a little bit, because I remember that scene in part one where Moheim tells Jessica, like, we've done what we can for you on Arrakis. Good luck. You know, we've laid the way for you. Right. So there is sort of maybe grasping at that idea. But again, we don't get that depth, to your point, Kara. We don't get that depth we do in the book. Uh, and the fuller picture of Fremen culture that we can perhaps interpret from the page. I am curious. There was a particular scene in the movie that Leo and I took issue with. <laughs> yeah. The water of life coma scene where Chani has to come in. And obviously the way the book plays out is dramatically different than the way the movie plays out where Jessica has to use the voice on Chani in order to compel her to reawaken Paul. We're curious what you thought of that scene. Yeah. The the slap was well well first of all the to me it was a 
Sleeping Beauty type where like her tear has to be involved somehow. That felt yeah. really, really weird to me. They kept trying to empower women by reversing tropes, but then it's like, why did you have to have the trope at all? Um, but yeah, in the in the book, it's it's a really uh, pivotal scene between Jessica and Chani because Jessica is supposed to be this all powerful Benny Jezra, and she she's run out of ideas. Right? Yeah. And she has to call Chani up from the safety of the South, and they have this bonding moment where Chani realizes that they're both mothers and they're both having their right. the person they love in peril, and you know it's all very subtle, you know, as per Herbert's style. And then, you know, and Chani is the one who's the smart one that figures out, oh, I bet, I bet he was reckless. I bet he took this when he wasn't supposed to. And like, let's try to revive him with that. Right. And, and that's when he kind of has the awakening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But in the movie, she, yeah, she's using the voice on another woman was, oh, that's kind of his own problematic thing as well. But she, you know, he wakes up and then she, she slaps him and, and, and storms off. Like, like she doesn't deeply care about, this person who is almost dead. Right. And and that for me, it's hard to see this deep, deep love story when you have this character continually seeming to kind of not like this guy. Yeah. That's very similar to the issues I had with that scene as well. Do you think in terms of Chani's agency and autonomy in the film, how, how do you think you've written about this in your article, of course, but do you think the film did anything to, adapt the character in a more modern way in order to give Chani a more active role in the story? Did the film succeed in that in any way? The film definitely tried to make her more modern. Whether or not that fits with the logic of the story is what I, I don't think. I think they made too many changes and the, the world building starts breaking down because things start make, not making sense anymore, um, partly because Paul doesn't even seem to want to have power at all, which is a like fundamental change from the book. But my issue is that people are conflating the idea of having agency with being opposed to things mm. or not helping Paul or not having to solely be, you know, having her actions related to the main character. But that's how stories work. If you have a main character, you have a protagonist, right? The other characters are, are helping, char- helping or hurting characters, like typically. And so if you're going to adapt this story, unless you want to, change Paul's gender. It's a story about, uh, you know, a young man's journey. And so the idea that she becomes more autonomous because she's opposed to Paul or has her own journey doesn't quite make sense because the story is about him. And a lot of the films are told kind of through his perspective. So it's to me, they were, they were trying to do two things at once. They were trying to have Paul's story but also trying to give Chani her own story and separate it from his and have him be opposing and then saying, oh, this makes her more agential. But actually it just really took out all of those other helping roles she had to Paul and being his support and his, you know, destined lover and just kind of made her again with the the constant storming off scenes. Yeah. I I don't think that you need to separate women and men and, and show them constantly being antagonistic to, to say that women, have independence or women can think for themselves and those kinds of things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There, I was looking through the comments to your article and it, it's actually kind of been blowing up. So congrats, first of all, on that front. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> on controversy, I guess it's controversial to, to you know, <laughs> talk about Johnny. <laughs> I mean, it's not controversial to have an opinion. So, but you know, the internet will be the internet. Yeah. Yeah. But, I did make the mistake of scrolling through some of the responses on social media to your article. And obviously there's just some like toxic stuff that's not worth uh, responding to in any sense. But I am curious, uh, a theme that kept coming up is a lot of folks will, who have read the book and then watched the movie, think that Chani is basically an accessory to Paul, right? Like in the book, like all she does is just be like Paul's loving companion and every choice she makes has to do with a Paul. And to some extent, I do agree with that criticism of the book, but I'm curious how you would respond to folks mm-hmm. who are taking that away from your article, that like Chani needed an improvement because in the book, she is nothing more than just like sort of Paul's right arm, and she, she doesn't get the chance to be her own full person. Well, yeah, but this comes back to my point about, well, what does that mean to be a character a side character or a supplementary character in a story about a young male hero. Um, you know, 
can't we say that about all the characters? Ufer, Gurney, Dr. Yui, yep. Leto, they're all there to serve Paul's story. So I don't think that fundamentally is a, you know, that's just how things work. Right. Because of the religious aspect in the book, she is more than Paul's love interest. Not saying that you can't also, you know, be a great love interest. Um, love stories are obviously <laughs> yeah. very popular yeah. and people can identify with them. <laughs> and yeah, she is the Sayadina. She has a she has a role separate from Paul, even when he's doing the sand writing test. She says, I have to stand apart today because I have this role and I can't really interfere with whether you live or die. And, you know, and he kind of teases her about that. And and she's the that the historic the historian role that women play in the Fremen culture is the Reverend Mother, the Sayadina. So she she ha- she has that going on for her regardless of what Paul's doing. And um, she has a role as as a young mother, which we don't see in the film as well. well. Of course, it's Paul's child, but that that in of itself is also something that many women can identify with and and do. And like, yes, there's a man involved, but you're you know, like being mother can be its own sense of identity and right and parenthood. Of course, I just the the idea that she needs to you know be her own character. Well, she is her own character. You know, if, if you don't like what she's doing in the book and you don't like the book's story then you know why would you adapt it if you <laughs> if you feel like she's not doing anything in the book then but she is that that's that's what i find frustrating mm. that's why i wrote the article it's like well let, let's actually right. see what she's doing in the book like is she a doormat is she a nothing character definitely not she's also you know daughter of late kinds which isn't in the film right right she's niece to stilgar you know she has status in from culture and society apart from paul right and and we we don't get that those nuances like she's she's mostly a fighter in the film and so i just find i find that's harder to to relate to her as a character and to see that well-roundedness yeah great point yeah i definitely left the theater feeling like she was diminished in some way and i think you've done a really good job in your article and just right now as you're talking putting to words some of the things that i felt were off like her being a ride or die lover of paul doesn't necessarily mean that she's lacking agency in like choosing to love and stand by this person like as things are happening and i get why you you would want to like as you listen to zendaya in interviews talk about playing johnny you can see a lot of her she clicks a lot with this character johnny like a young woman in today's world understands the johnny that exists in the film i see that alignment because johnny was perhaps changed to be more accessible for young people today and that is in spite of the very real character that she might have been in the book. But, so it's hard. I mean, I've, I've talked to young people. I've talked to Gen Z and, and, you know, they're not all on board with her. But I think, hmm. isn't it problematic that we're saying to to fall in love and, and to love a man deeply is something that we can't do to be independent? Like that, that to me is, I feel like she she leaves that film alone. And I don't know why is that empowering? to be alone. And, and I, I don't wish that for young people or any people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's fair. I, I am curious what you thought of the love story though. Like, do you think the movie achieved its goal of convincing us that Paul and Chani love each other deeply? And do you think the changes undermined that in any way? I, I feel like I know where, what your answer is going to be, but I'm curious nonetheless. I don't think they did a good job of showing a, a great love story. And and partly this was because they, for whatever reason, chose not to have the, the two-year time jump. Everything felt rushed, including especially Paul, like his his rise to power, his rise to leadership. That That's not believable to me for that to happen in the space of a few weeks or a few months. Mm. And, yeah. and the same with the love story. Now in the book, Herbert kind of, shortcuts that a little bit by having Chani's already had uh, well during the spite when they when they're all sharing the spice right, right. Chani has visions she's already had visions of, of paul and her together so in that way it's kind of making it acceptable that they rush into this young romance because she said you know how do i already feel like i know you like i, I know yeah, you right, and that's right, that's right. kind of like nice love story and it's like it's it's okay that they're both young teens right they they've already <laughs> seen themselves in love in in their visions and so they, they know it works to, out. You know, shortcut all of the first dates <laughs> yeah. and all those kinds of things. Yeah. Right. That awkward first six months of like, is she yeah, really exactly. into me? <laughs> the, the film, it just, it speeds everything up so much yeah. that I just, again, that, that logic, the logic of, 
here he is. Okay. Now suddenly they're having to remain, you know, okay. Then suddenly this, and then suddenly, Oh, now he's the bad guy at the end of the movie. And we know that because Chani has been skeptical the whole time, but where's the time for the, the buildup of Paul as a problem. I get that they wanted to show Paul more as a problem, but how can it be a problem when the whole time he never seemed to want it? Hmm. Like he's so reluctant the whole time. It was hard for me to believe that he's now a power hungry bad guy <laughs> or whatever the message was. Yeah. And that's a good point. I think a lot of folks, especially a lot of my friends who haven't read the book and only saw the movie, they also walked away a little confused by the turn in the third act from Paul going, I don't want this. I'm not going south. I refuse to follow this prophecy to like long live the fighters right into battle, dark clip. I'm harking in. Let's go. Yeah. 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 And, and I think perhaps the, the movie was a bit too subtle with that turn and maybe didn't give that transformation the time it needed, to your point, the time it needed to like really, really settle in and land with the audience. Yeah. And, in, and I get that it's hard to show inner thoughts. That's a big part of the yeah. book. Yeah. But when you, right. when you look in the book, you know, Jessica is worried about what he's doing, you know, from the still tent scene, she's worried about it and thinking about it. And, you know, there, there are other there's other ways or other characters that they could have put that critique in to putting it into Chani, I think was such a, was such a radical change to make. And, and, and it doesn't let us enjoy that love story and those kind of other things that she could have had going on. So I understand the need to have a dissenting voice, but did it have to be Chani? Mm. Because now Chani can't be all those other things that, that she was in the book. Right. Yeah. That's a really good point too. Like, uh, maybe Jessica would have been a more cohesive with the original text dissenting voice than someone like Chani. You think that would work better? Well, I wish they would have had Jessica like she was in the book, which was like an amazing character and mother and, you know, strong support to her son. But, you know, they also had to change her character as well. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> but, but I mean, the there's also the question of like, does Hollywood need to handhold everyone? can we just see Paul rise and see that this is a problem in, in other ways without having a voice there so obviously giving him the side eye? You know, it's kind of like part of a larger debate about, you know, how much do people need to be spoon-fed the moral message? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Totally. That's like a bigger debate about art <laughs> and cinema. Yeah. Well, because like, you know, Star Wars and Marvel are constantly criticized for being too... I don't too shallow, too obvious, too good and bad or good versus evil. Yeah, totally. And you know, it's like, okay, well then can't we have a more complex story in Dune? Like, why did you have to <laughs> do these changes? Like to me, if you're going to make changes to, to something, right, they need to be justifiable. And I, I, I have yet to really see a great counter argument or, or a justification for these besides we wanted to make sure people didn't get the wrong idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, actually, like, since we're already sort of on the topic, our next question for you was, it's clear from your writings and from our conversation now, you're not the biggest fan of these changes to characters like Chani and Jessica. In, in a hypothetical dream adaptation of yours, how would you like the, how would you have liked these characters to be handled and translated from book to screen? Yeah, so for me, the, the 2000 Sci-Fi Channel miniseries did a great job of showing the female characters as they were in the book. And that they were able to show Paul's rise to power as problematic because you see him go from kind of whiny teenager to <laughs> to maturing and stepping into these um, religious roles. And they don't use they don't use voiceovers for the dialogue um, for the for the inner thoughts, but they do show you know they show Jessica warning him about what he's doing, and he kind of dismisses her because he's already on that path. And and they show Chani being this great love interest and a support to him and, and the religious role, they, they show all of the things in the book and you can see Paul's transformation and you can make up your own mind about how you think about that in, in, in that, in the mini series. And I think they really, they leaned into the character development and they had the time to, to, to look at that versus the film adaptations, even though this one was divided into two, didn't seem to want to engage deeply with characters and with Fremen culture. And, and that to me was, was a, a decision to make for, to have more focus on visual elements and, and the cinematic quality. But 
you know, who am I supposed to be invested in and care about as a character was a lot harder for me in these films. Yeah. Like, do, you know, I don't really identify with Paul because he's kind of dragging his feet the whole way and seems forced into things. I don't really identify with Chani because she's just kind of seems like frustrated and angry about everything. Like I wasn't sure who I was supposed to follow. And, and that's really important for, for a film to emotionally grab you. I don't know. Did you guys have someone that you felt like you could follow or emotionally <laughs> identify with? Duke Leto, because he's a babe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but then he's dead. But then he's dead, right? <laughs> Which, you know, it's, it, it happens to the best of us. Uh, we did want to wrap up. Uh, we have one more question for you, Kara. Um, the three of us, of course, huge Dune fans, right? Longtime <laughs> fans, love the books, yeah. love these stories. Yeah. They're extremely meaningful to us. And to Leo's point from earlier, we came into these films with preconceived notions with attachments to certain characters or certain story arcs already and we came into this film looking for those same attachments uh, and for the film to hit us in the same way perhaps or in a similar way that the book did um i'm curious though if you're able to attach the book detach the book from the movie do you think movie chani or movie jessica or the number of other changes made in this film do you think independent of the book chani stands on her own as a character in this story if we were to examine it as just denny villeneuve's dune detached from frank herbert's dune just as a thought exercise of course it's an adaptation and we we should be comparing the two but i'm curious if you think as just a standalone film in a vacuum it holds up okay that's really difficult to do but yeah i'll try um <laughs> yeah, i mean agreed. i had i had issues with how chani was portrayed in part one because i think she she was quite ex- exoticized as this dream girl that he has in his visions like so many visions of chani right and and the setup of the opening i think is also um actually i haven't really talked about this and i haven't really seen other people talking about like the opening was quite changed and it seemed like we were going to be getting the Fremen perspective or getting Chani's perspective, mm. right? Like we're introduced yeah, to them totally. much earlier than the book, but that, that doesn't seem to pay off later, at least, you know, especially in part one. So we see that right here. She's in her still suit. She's fighting in the desert, girl, a warrior. And then all the other scenes for the middle of the movie, she's out in the sand wearing sandals and her hair is blowing in the wind and she's not saying anything. You know, in Paul's visions in the book, she says something, right? She's tell me about your home world, uh, you know, water's your home world. And, and then we finally see her at, again at the end of part one. And here she's back in her still suit and she's really grouchy toward Paul, you know, which she was in the book as well. Like, you know, disdainful of this, this kid who stumbled upon them. Right. So, okay, we're, we're setting her up to be this, you know, this love interest for Paul in the first one. But then in the, in the second one, she... Is that really that like the begrudging attitude she has toward him was is hard for me to see why she would fall in love with him. I can see why he falls in love with her because he's been having visions of her, right? And like right, you right, know, he right. stares googly eyed right. at her. That that makes sense. She's beautiful. His his, the, his character makes sense. But outside of the book, for me to see her, you know, like the first thing she said to him is like, You're not the Lasan Agabe, right? Like, who are you? Okay. <laughs> Where is getting back to the point about where's the time span where she's able to, to, to believably change her mind and come to fall in love with him. I, I don't see that. So seeing her just, just as a, as a female character, where am I supposed to believe that she comes around to that, you know, to being his, his love interest and, yep. you know, seeing her with a rocket launcher and, and going out and fighting. Cool. Great. But you know, what else is there to her? Like, like people, some people comment online, where's her backstory? Mm. You're going to say that you're going to make her a full character a- apart from Paul. Shouldn't we get some more backstory for her? Shouldn't we get more justification for her to fall in love with this outsider? She seems really skeptical of outsiders. Yeah. So I think that for me, the believability of her as a young woman is strained, even not as an adaptation. Mm. Yeah. And perhaps, uh, situation where that Liet Kynes connection, some background, some history, maybe how she was raised, like that that could have fleshed out that character more uh, in the movie. Um, but of course, those things weren't right. included either. I thought they were going to, like by having, you know, having Liet Kynes be a black woman and, and having Chani be a woman of color, I thought, oh, okay, they're going to, 
but then right right didn't. like they're clearly <laughs> setting up the relationship the like mother daughter relationship but yeah we never got it yeah okay well, leo did you have any other questions that that runs through our our list that we wanted to chat with you about kara i guess abu would probably give space to plug or <laughs> what's the oh yeah yeah of course of course yeah yeah kara <laughs> do, if you want to let her we're gonna have links in our show notes to your articles and to your um twitter account and your online profiles but if you want to also let our listeners know where they can find you and your work please do sure so i usually have always looked at the book dune but uh, last year i decided with all of the new content coming out on screen it was time for me to finally <laughs> start looking at the adaptations um, even though I, I love the book and I'm very focused, you know, dedicated to the book. So um, my my newest book just came out um, recently called Adaptations of Dune. And so this one, I looked at the fateful David Lynch 1984 film Dune, which is a love it or hated it film. I looked at the 2000 um, John Harrison miniseries. And then I looked at Dune part one. And so um, that that's my book. I've also got two previous books, um, which are more academic, focused on uh, Benny Gesserit and a general overview of Dune. But my plan is to write a sequel that will cover this uh, Dune Part 2 as well as the Children of Dune miniseries and possibly other Dune content. But um, you can find me at dunescholar.com. And I, I also blog about Dune, which I haven't been doing recently because I've been working on the book. But now that the film's come out, I felt felt compelled <laughs> to start blogging again about yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Um, yeah. all these characters. There's so much to unpack there. Yeah, there is. There is. Well, amazing. Thanks so much again for chatting with us. And it's always fun to geek out with a fellow Dune nerd who's probably totally read the books a bit too much. It's a curse. <laughs> well, that was super cool. That, that was, was so much fun. That was so much fun. Really appreciated Kara coming on and talking to us. I think she kind of came in knowing that we didn't necessarily agree with her <laughs> takes on everything. So, and, and I, yeah, I, I didn't yeah, yeah. want to be too pushy. Right. Uh, I course. wanted her to feel comfortable, like expressing her view, even if it was not what we agreed with uh, entirely. But I, I think she genuinely, I don't know how you felt about it, but she's given me a lot to think about. Uh, I was telling her after we stopped recording, we were still chatting with her. Yeah. And I was telling her like, I'm going to be keeping this conversation we just had with her in mind the next time I watch the movie. Yeah, and you know, I think I still a little bit am team. I think with the three movies together will change my perspective of everything in the second movie. I think she's right that it should stand entirely on its own. Totally. But I think uh, I'm not going to go back and watch just the two towers. I'm going to watch the trilogy. <laughs> so like I think an intact, really holistically excellent trilogy is still redeeming in some dimension. So I very much agreed with a lot of what she said, the way she presented her ideas with us was, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like, yeah, true. Right. right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. She, she's uh -huh. extremely articulate, which I appreciated, you know, she's getting awesome. into yeah. some like really dense topics and is able to present her view in a way where you're kind of like, yeah, wait, wait a second. This is all logical. I don't see anything <laughs> like I'm following. Holy I think shit. I agree with Do this. Do I hate this movie? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. She, she, yeah. She does kind of have that effect where you're just kind of like, yeah, I agree. Totally. This is, <laughs> this is super smart. Uh, maybe I'm the big dummy and I don't understand what's happening. So I, I appreciated that. It, it's clear that she comes at this from a very academic scholarly point of view and, and is able yeah. to speak to that at that level. Uh, it was a fun conversation. And again, I, I don't think I'm walking away totally changed on my opinion i think i still stand For by sure. what i think of book chani and what i think about movie chani and in general being happy with both and having criticisms of both mm -hmm. but i also am hoping just like you that the third film will sort of round out some of these questions that we're left with and i'm sure it'll raise more questions you know we're we're nerds we're always going to be picking things apart but that's half the fun of it well that was our conversation with Kara, and that's been our episode on Chani. That's right. That's right. And of course, this is not the end, much like Johnny said in the first film. <laughs> this is only the beginning. <laughs> this is, there's more, there's more, <laughs> more stuff is happening. Keep listening. <laughs> that's right. So, of course, we want to remind you here at the end of the show, a couple of ways to support us, but also to get in touch, because much like we were very interested in hearing 
Kara's opinion on this. We're interested in hearing yours as well. Indeed. So definitely email us. A couple of reminders very quickly. Two great ways to support us. Become a Patreon supporter. You get ad-free episodes. You get bonus content. You get early book club access. Uh Patreon.com slash Gamjabar. The other best way to support this show is to go check out our merch store, GamjabarShop.com. Buy yourself something nice. We got some beautiful custom-made Dune artwork on there. Uh, And we slap that shit on everything. T-shirts, mugs, a sticker. So go check it out. ComJabarShop.com. All of those links are in the show notes below. And then, of course, like Abu said, email us. Let us know what you thought of today's episode. Let us know what you thought about Chani in the adaptation. But, of course, just what you thought uh, and what you think in general. And also, if you have cute pets, send pictures. We love them. please do. Yes. Please do. Our email is and has always been and will forever be gomjabarpodcast at gmail.com. You can send us messages there. A bold statement to say will forever be. <laughs> I know. Because I didn't on, on the timeline of the universe, Leo, forever is but a speck. Yeah, that's our, true. our listeners in 2234 <laughs> are going to be like, what the fuck is Gmail? What the fuck is email? <laughs> what the fuck is Gmail? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to jack into the matrix and eat, like reach out to these dudes with my opinion on Johnny. Yeah. And they said forever. And then they take another sip from their drink and they put their drink back down on their robo table. <laughs> <laughs> I hope people remember that. That is, that is the that most obscure understand. of callbacks to a joke from, <laughs> I don't even know which episode, but one of our less popular episodes too. Right. Man. <laughs> Only, only super fans, you know? All four of you. <laughs> Just lost it at that You're gym. who I made it for. You're <laughs> laughing right now. This one is for you. <laughs> well, friends, there is no real ending. It's just the place where you stop the recording. But this podcast is always one step beyond logic, so help spread the word of Muad'Dib and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to check out the other shows on the Lore Party Podcast Network on loreparty.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at lore underscore party. We're also on TikTok at Gomjabar Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, whoever controls the podcast controls the universe. We'll see you on the Golden Path.